Thank you very, very much. I'm going to introduce Bob Stork in just a moment, but uh, he's also chairing the Florida Tax Watch Center for Smart Justice, and we'll talk more about that. We have some special dignitaries we want to thank and uh, for, for participating. Uh, Senator Paula Dockery. Paula, please, Senator, please stand. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Thad Altman. Thad, where are you, my friend? Great friend. Another great champion and friend, uh, Representative Dennis Baxley. Dennis, back again. Back again. Uh, we had uh, Senator uh, Ellen Bogdanoff. She uh, left and uh, uh, Rich Glorioso, Representative Rich Glorioso, who should be here again shortly. We also have uh, another very dear friend, Al Cardenas, for the American Conservative Union. Where's Al? Al? Uh, Bob Stark is chair of the Center for Smart Justice, and also Allison DeFore is the vice chair, and I think the chief instigator of much of this, Allison. <laughs> and, 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 increasingly, and increasingly, we're able to dress him up and take him out. Can you imagine? Uh, it's a, it's a, many, many years I've known Allison, it's, he's got the bug now, so, uh, and a uh, great... <laughs> Actually, I think it's, he's cleaning up his act because one of our great partners is Vicki Lucas. Vicki's a great partner helping us with Pew. Vicki, please stand. And her real partner of crime is here, uh, Sylvester, Sylvester Lucas. Where are you, Syl? Thank you for coming from Miami. Uh, a couple of key partners. Uh, Barney Bishop, presidency of Associated Industries of Florida. Barney, where are you? Please stand. Thank you. <laughs> Having come back and extended the Panama Canal, I saw that and cutting those deals. Um, we uh, actually had, had lunch with uh, the, the English ambassador to Her Majesty. And uh, so I, I asked him, I found out that he has the rank, same rank as 007. I said, who, you know, who's, uh, who's more powerful? You know, he says, well, he can execute people, but I can execute contracts and, and treaties. <laughs> so, uh, also, uh, Tom Perrin is representing Bob McClure, President CEO of uh, James Madison Institute. Thomas, you, you know you're getting old in the business. I uh, I went to uh, Leadership Tallahassee's first class, an inaugural class, with Tom's dad. So, <laughs> uh oh, uh oh. Uh, but also a very, very long-standing and good friend. Not old, long-standing friend. Uh, President of the Florida Council of 100, Susan Perrigo. Susan, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, the Florida Tax Watch Center for Smart Justice is one of uh, five centers of excellence at Florida Tax Watch and is actively coordinating a statewide effort with key state based and national partner organizations to bring smart, reasonable, and common sense justice reform to Florida that will enhance public safety enhance public safety through proven cost-effective measures that hold offenders accountable. The Center for Smart Justice at Florida Tax Watch conducts research, issues publications, conducts uh, uh, events such as this, such as our Justice Reform Journal. Those who wish to receive, uh, we sent about, uh, we sent I think six, I think we have copies of those outside. Uh, those that have already been published are sent out on a weekly or several times a week of what's happening, what's going on, what's about to happen. If you'd like to, we're sending a, a, a sign-up sheet, so please give us your email, name and email. We'll make sure you're on there. Uh, which engages in other meaningful actions to put legs on this research and more importantly see that we get, get her done. Our, our wonderful governor is about let's get to work. We bring that to another level and let us get to work, but get her done. Because it doesn't matter if you get to work if you don't get her done. So we want to get her done. It's a good old uh, southern, southern uh, strategy, my friend. Using smart initiatives to reform the criminal justice system and the juvenile justice system will save Florida taxpayers money. In fact, we believe ultimately hundreds of millions of dollars annually uh, while reducing crime. What a combination. Improving public safety and continuing to improve the productivity of Florida's workforce. These are men, largely men, but also some women, women coming out of our prisons, we think as crime colleges. They go in for minor offenses, usually alcohol, drug related, about 60% either directly related to drugs or indirectly. And they actually learn an improved life of crime because the management of our criminal justice system and our corrections puts them in jail and cells with people that are hardened criminals. Uh, unlike many other states, they come back out uh, more knowledgeable, and less prepared to live a productive life, more prepared to live a criminal life. That, endangers Florida's citizens, businesses, our visitors, and our families, and our seniors. 
and, and ha damage their property. So 90% of folks are gonna come out of prison or not, more than that. We wanna make sure when they come out, they're responsible, more moral, and more engaged and prepared to be productive, tax-paying citizens. Okay, that's our goal. In 1980, Florida spent less than $170 million a year on corrections. The current state budget spends $2,400,000,000. That's a big, big increase. With our state facing a $3.8 billion shortfall this year, the cost of the corrections budget increasing, now is the time for reform. Now is the time for smart justice reform that reduces crime while saving money. Florida Tax Watch has produced significant amount of smart justice reform research with many here and uh, the audience being uh, partners in that. The cost saving, uh, government cost saving task force identified 24 specific smart justice recommendations that will save taxpayers $400 million in this coming year. Um, we're pleased that not only did the transition team take this, we engaged uh, as part of this effort to find $4.6 billion. But, uh, thank you, Bob. But also, uh, also a significant effort to uh, uh, find money that we can use to pay our unemployment comp as well as balance that budget. We're gonna have a big challenge in making sure we can get people back to work and you can't if they have to pay a, a five, 10, or 15 fold increase in their Florida and federal unemployment compensation insurance. So these savings balance the budget and anything extra used towards those kind of things that make us more competitive. Uh, also want to thank and recognize David Hart as a member and a, and a coordinator, a, actually a former board member, very active member of our task force and one of our key partners. David, where are you? Thank you, David. David is, David is one of those that are get her done, so thank you, David. <laughs> uh, this, the state trend is not a result of a population growth or an increase in the crime rate. In fact, Florida's crime rate has steadily declined over the past 20 years. In fact, New York has a larger population than Florida, but a, a prison population about half our size, and their crime rate has actually fallen even more than ours. Not that we want to emulate all the things of New York, but that's one good thing. What we really like is our, our good conservative friends in Texas, uh, Louisiana and Indiana have done some really smart things that we need to replicate. This dramatic increase is a result of higher incarceration rates, which has not made our st streets safer or offenders less likely to commit crimes. Unfortunately, Florida still leads the nation in locking people up at a time when many other states are finding ways to reduce their crime rate while reducing the rate of incarceration. And I mentioned our sister states such as Texas, Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi have successfully implemented policy and programs to reduce their prison roles save taxpayers tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars and create more cost-effective outcomes. Folks, what this is not only smart justice, it's good old-fashioned common sense applied to the thing we work very hard to and that's uh, protecting our, our families, our seniors, our small business pocketbooks. Um, if at this point, one of our good partners um, in fighting crime, <laughs> uh, we're gonna ask our chairman of our Center for Smart Justice Bob Stork to come up and please introduce him. Bob. Welcome. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure. And all I'm going to do is, in, no speeches, I'm going to in, introduce uh, Mr. Grover Norquist. He's a preeminent member of the modern conservative movement. Mr. Norquist has spent more than a quarter of a century at the helm of the Americans for Tax Reform, a broad-based coalition that fights against higher taxes at every level of government formed at the request of President Reagan. He also serves on the board of the National Rifle Association and the American Conservative Union. He is equally known for his dedicated and dog pursuit of the conservative policies in which he is a sharp and quick wit. I just witnessed that at a previous meeting. Don't challenge him. <laughs> Mr. Norquist is also famous, or infamous, for starting the Wednesday meetings the informal discussion that has spawned one of the most prolific conservative activist network in the country. A well-known proponent of the starve the beast strategy the government, of government reduction, Mr. Norquist has stated that he would like to see government small enough to drown in a bathtub. Very, very pro. <laughs> <laughs> he received early schooling in the nature of business when his father would take bites out of his and his siblings' ice cream cones, <laughs> labeling each one of those, that's a sales tax, uh, that's an income tax. <laughs> Mr. Norquist was one of the earliest signatories on the right on crime, 
applying the principles of limited government, free markets, and personal liberty to, to reforming our criminal justice system. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Grover Norquist. Thank you. I run a taxpayer group, and our job is to uh, make the government uh, smaller and less expensive so that people can be freer. Uh, and over the last couple of years, the folks on Right on Cr Crime came and, and spoke with me and others and, and made the case that conservatives, I mean, it's not like we weren't busy for the last 25 years. We did, we did stuff. We were working on all sorts of things we thought the government was doing that it shouldn't do, things we thought the government was doing too expensively. Uh, but it is true that we were not, as, as uh, fiscal watchdogs, as taxpayer advocates, spending uh, much or any time uh, looking at the cost of the judicial system and of prisons. Uh, and uh, oh, as, as pointed out, the numbers have been creeping, galloping up, uh, both in absolute dollar costs for each of the states and as a percentage of the state budget, uh, and compared to other things that the state uh, is doing. And I think it's very important, and, and so I got involved in, in, in Right on Crime. This largely, at least from the people I've worked with, uh, it seemed to come out of Texas, and that made me feel fairly comfortable, because I'm from Massachusetts. And um, <laughs> if you're from Massachusetts and you say, I've got this really interesting idea on how to reform the criminal justice system, um, people laugh at you, because they're not interested in listening to what you know, Michael Dukakis' state, uh, you know, the, the state that let people who were sentenced, I mean, some of you may be too young to remember this, but <laughs> the Democrats ran for president a governor of the state of Massachusetts who had his policy to allow people who had been sentenced to prison for life without parole. That was the deal they cut. We're not going to have the death penalty. We'll have life without parole for violent murderers. And he let them out of prison on weekends. Okay. Um, and some of them didn't come back, and some of them killed again. Uh, so th there are a couple of reasons why I think those in the center right should be focusing on reforming the criminal justice system. One is, if you think the government should do fewer things, maybe limited to things that are actually mentioned or alluded to in the Constitution, uh, and therefore ought not to be doing other things that over time it has gotten into, one of your project lines is not just making a list of all the silly things that the federal government or state government or Detroit does on a given day, but also to make a list of the things that they should be doing and perhaps do those competently and do those responsibly, and do those uh, in a productive way. Because th th that wonderful quote about limiting the size of government actually came in response to somebody saying, well, you, so you're against having a government. You're against government. And the answer is no. We're not against the government having a government. We're against governments too big. And then the argument is, we want, I would like to make it very small. Okay. But we want a government that actually protects our rights, that protects people's lives and property, uh, that has a judicial system that protects contracts and, and property rights and individuals' uh, liberty, and a national defense capable of keeping the Canadians on their side of the border. Um, <laughs> and then beyond that, you get into some fuzzy areas about what the government should be doing. But we ought to be spending some time on seriously addressing the size and scope of the military budget and the size and scope of the judiciary uh, and, and the prison budgets and the decisions. I mean, how big your military is depends on what you want to do with it. How big your prison system is depends on what you're trying to do with it. Um, and I think we need to look at are there ways to keep us safer while spending less money more competently in a more focused way to actually reduce crime. Um, and I know that our friends, and one of the challenges is when you talk about judicial reform or prison reform, the water's been a little bit poisoned by some of our friends on the left whose actual agenda when you read their books is not to have prisons anymore for anyone. 
um, and to argue that nobody who does anything, the person who you know, cut off your head was, had bad thoughts when he was very young, and it's not his fault. Uh, and so some of the people who did prison reform, criminal justice reform on the left over the last 40 years have done a lot of damage to the idea. So people's ears shut down when the guy from Vermont comes in and wants to explain how the rest of us, who should be in prison and who has to. And just because somebody has tried to do something wrongly or in a less than constructive manner doesn't mean that the whole project is, is silly or not important. And so why it's incumbent on conservatives uh, and Republicans to focus on this is one, if we don't do it, it won't get done. Because even a liberal with a good idea comes in with, 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 with Banquo's ghost Dukakis standing behind him and he just scares all the children. And nobody wants to look at that as an option. But with conservative leadership, and again, this is why Texas, Governor Rick Perry, the Texas legislature, they're taking a lead um, and, and doing it in Texas, and there have been some serious reforms that have seriously dropped the number of people in prison, the amount of money you spend, and reduced crime uh, and violence. Uh, and we can sell Texas's good idea in Ohio. We can sell something that's been tried in Texas by Texas elected officials who've gotten themselves reelected um, after trying it. This is the elected officials like to know that it's a good idea and that it won't cost them the next election. That's not necessarily the order in which they ask those questions of themselves. Um, but if you're going to ask somebody to go out on the ice, it's awfully nice for them to be able to look out and see that other people heavier than them have been standing on the ice and it doesn't uh, go through. Uh, and again, Texas is a tougher audience than perhaps Florida. It is certainly a tougher audience than New Jersey and, and uh, Michigan uh, in, in terms of getting elected officials and sheriffs and the cops and the criminal justice system to look at some of these reforms. So right on crime and some of the, a number of the proposals that are, have actually been introduced here in Florida, I think begin to ask the questions. What are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce crime. We're not, you know, it's not that we're mad at people <coughs> um, who have been bad. We may be mad at them as well. But what do we do to make sure they don't commit crimes again? And for some of them, that means locking them up and never seeing them again, okay? Some of them. The question is, is that everybody? Uh, and I testified, I, I got involved in this over the last five or six years in some working groups in D.C. where conservatives were thinking about the over criminalization in Washington. And it took us several years to get an answer, the beginning of an answer to the question, how many things, how many federal crimes are that can send you to prison, okay? And at one point we actually came up with 2,000 and the last time I checked it was about 4,000, okay? And by the way, as I would, one of the first things I was ever taught as a kid was that ignorance of the law is no defense, okay? There are 4,000 things the federal government can send you to prison for. Can you list five? Okay. Um, and yet, when you go, well, I didn't know. You know some of it's not filling out the paperwork on, on things. It, it, uh, so it seems to me a little bit rough. And we need to think through, because elected officials like to, and, and maybe you hear their arguments for term limits on some of this stuff. Uh, I testified on a hearing, federal hearing, on mandatory minimums. Because one of the things, people go, oh, we've got all these pinko judges that are letting people, we have to have a mandatory minimum because we don't trust the judges. Well, you might want to get better judges. But the other question is when they throw those mandatory minimums up, I was looking at the federal list of mandatory minimums, okay? Um, stuff that's been in the newspaper recently, 35-year mandatory minimum. Treason, five-year mandatory minimum. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and you're looking at these things and the gravity of the crime and the mandatory minimum were not attached. The outrage that the public would feel towards a particular crime at the time that it was getting focus, big mandatory minimum. Treason, five years. Um, it, 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 I'm almost for letting the politicians pass this stuff with a four-year term limit so they can pass these wildly exaggerated 
um, sentences, meaning, you know, message, I care. That's what the elected officials trying to tell you. I'm very, very mad at people who do that. Please vote for me. Um, now, is that something that you, I mean, you, society wants to send a signal, this is very bad, we don't want you doing this anymore, and we're really irritated at it. Um, but do you want 35-year sentences for some of that stuff indefinitely? Or perhaps should these be revisited every 10 years so that we could rethink some of this? And we just went through this uh, at the national level with the whole crack cocaine, powder cocaine rules, which in the 80s, crack cocaine was devastating minority communities. The Black Caucus asked to have a 100 to 1 ratio. This is in Washington, DC. And we passed a 100 to 1 ratio for mandatory prison time for crack cocaine versus powder cocaine, 100 to 1 ratio based on weight, um, which n now was viewed as excessive, and the very um, guys in Congress who'd been demanding it were now insisting that it was a nasty plot against them um, to have these laws, and so we had to figure out how to disentangle and undo a law that the Black Caucus had actually sort of insisted on at one point, and now wanted to move off of, but all the Republicans were scared that if they voted against this now, they'd be for crack cocaine. Uh, and, and eventually what happened was we had a vote in the House, which was by unanimous consent to take it from 101 to 18. And um, the Republicans had to promise not to point out whose idea it was. And, they, and everybody should have had a, to, to agree not to politicize the issue. And then it passed unanimously. Uh, and that was, what, that passed in the late 80s, all through the 90s. This is, that, that's a 20-year project to fix one interesting radical disparity that I don't think made sense at the time, and, and yet when it gets put in, who wants to take it out? Who wants to be the, they, they passed a similar law, federal law, federalizing carjacking. Okay, when do you think we get Congress to pass the law legalizing carjacking, right? I mean, it, it's not like the 50 states don't have laws against carjacking, but if you got rid of the federal law against carjacking, the headline for anybody who ran for re-election could be, might not, could be, and Fred voted to legalize carjacking. Yes, we like Fred. Um, well, there's a reason it's difficult for people to, to back, to make some of these changes. So I think it's important not only to look at the cost of incarceration, to look at who gets incarcerated, how many people we want to have incarcerated, and are there ways to reduce that while reducing crime, okay? This is not some argument that we shouldn't care about crime or we shouldn't be, mat be punishing criminals or putting people in prison. I think prisons are just fine. I think some people deserve to spend the rest of their lives there. Um, but the question is how many people spending how much time there, uh, and again, those on the center right bring a credibility to the field that our friends on the left don't. Now we can hold hands with them and we're gonna to need to vote together on a number of these things, Republican, Democrat coalitions, right, left coalitions, but it really does have to start on the right because the left has been advocating some of these things for a long time, but mixed in with some sensible reforms, they've been advocating nonsensible reforms. They get all mixed together and then they lose the general public and you don't make, we stop bad stuff, but you also don't make progress on some of the ideas that were, that were visible. I worked on a broad coalition uh, in D.C., which after several years of being there, I realized was me and a collection of conservatives who had a relative in prison. Um, <laughs> and and it, it became interesting to me that everybody else had the, a personal connection to why they had gotten involved in rethinking judicial and, and prison reform, uh, and we needed, we needed a broader coalition than that. We couldn't count on the number of conservatives who had a relative in prison to build our coalition. We had to go beyond that uh, and, uh, and speak to this issue. I think right on crime has actually broken through uh, for two reasons. One is the whole Tea Party government is spending too much, let's look at the cost of government, which is broken through and everyone goes, okay, we have to look at the cost of government, and that means we can look at the cost of prisons too, um, in a way that hadn't been happening before. Um, uh, so that, I think, has, has made it possible. The other part is the Chuck Colson element, the 
Um, the whole effort to reform prisons from within that was almost non-legislative, just Chuck Colson and, and prison ministries going out into prisons. And so you had a lot of, of people coming back from spending time in prisons who didn't have rest, relatives there, but they knew what they were talking about. They knew the stories. They knew what was, what was working and what, what wasn't. And they had alternative issues of how do you take somebody who's, been, who's committed a crime and get them to spend the rest of their life more productively and not at the taxpayer expense. Uh, and I think both of those, the, so let's spend less, and, 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 and the Christian fellowship, prison fellowship effort, both those streams make it easier for elected officials to rethink how they address these issues. Um, they make it possible for people in the middle to say, well, if conservatives in Texas are doing this, I've got some cover that if I do it, it's not, you know, if it didn't work, people will go, well, at least you had a reason to suspect it would. But the fact that you look at it working in other states, uh, I think, makes it much more comfortable for people to make that progress. And again, the same thing's true on looking to reform defense spending. That is a project that's also coming from the right of center in Washington, D.C., not from, from the left of center, for all the same reasons. I mean, Nixon can go to China. Um, the, uh, and, and, and Chuck Colson uh, has been able to, Nixon was able to get rid of the draft. A Democrat could not have done that. Nixon was able to go to China. A Democrat could not have done that. And here, right on crime, and conservatives who are both fiscal conservatives, but also the prison fellowship tendency, um, I think both give us opportunities. There are a series of pieces of legislation here in Florida. Um, I think they all move in, uh, in, in the right direction, and I'm very happy um, to play a, a, a small role in the effort nationally to basically suggest to state legislators, come on out, you know, mix some metaphors, the water's fine, come on out, the ice is thick enough, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's uh, that it's safe to have this conversation and it's necessary to have this conversation. And there are benefits, both in savings to taxpayers uh, and in, in, in reforming a system so fewer lives have less damage done to them, both the victims of crime and to the people who have committed crimes in the past uh, that hopefully will cease to commit crimes uh, in the future. So um, with all of those, I'll uh, cheerfully um, take questions, but I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think this is a sea change. Um, and again, the fact that it comes out of Texas, the fact that it's moving in Florida before some other states, I mean, this is going to get to Connecticut and Massachusetts a long time after Texas and Florida and other states have test-driven it, uh, demonstrated that, uh, that these approaches work. Uh, and again, we, politicians need to feel they won't be attacked for moving in a reform direction the fact that conservatives are taking leadership of this, the fact that uh, there is pressure to save money, the fact that the Christian right has, has vouched for some of both the existence of problems, that a lot of, I mean, if you don't have any relatives in prison, you don't know about any problems. It doesn't occur to you. Um, and, and so a lot of people didn't have any sense that there was, one, that, they knew it was costing money, but they didn't have a sense that things were uh, going less well than, than they could. So with those thoughts, questions, arguments, something I'm leaving out, yes? Well, the, the savings come from building fewer prisons, decommissioning prisons, not having as many prisons. The question of what do you do with nonviolent criminals? What do you do with people on probation and parole? Um, an idea that's actually moved further than other places in, is in Hawaii, where if somebody violates probation, you bring them in that weekend and they spend the weekend in jail rather than 
wait until they've done it five times and put them in prison for the next five years to, to, to serve out. So, so there seems to be some, some people and some criminals have uh, shorter time horizons than you might wish. And if you say to them, misbehave, break your parole requirements, you go to prison this weekend for the next month, you know, next month's weekends, and then we'll revisit it. Or you say, do it again and again and again, and when we finally get tired of this, we'll put you in prison for the, for the next five years. The first one gets their attention more than the second one and seems to actually change behavior. So I think you know, more certain punishment, but not necessarily longer. I mean, if you, I, mean I don't know, when you were young, at, you know, you know the idea, we're going to do something to you for five years, or we're going to do something to you for 50 years. There wasn't that much difference in my mind. Okay, um, and so I don't know that, that, that some of the lengths of sentence, I'm not sure people are getting the same message that we think we're sending, we really mean it this time, this is important, do we have your attention? The difference between 10 years and 40 years, I, I, I don't know whether that really has that impact. And some of the questions on drug, putting people into drug treatment uh, versus prisons, um, how do you do that in a way that protects citizens and helps people get off drugs. And they seem to have done that with some success in Texas. Yes, and then I'll go. We're uh, lucky enough to have smart senators like Paul and Dr. Scott Altman here with us who basically have been working on this issue for a long time. But I, I, don't, I don't see uh, this uh, getting a national attention. And I'm wondering what uh, you all in uh, Washington are doing to make people understand that in order to really enhance public safety and save with respect to recidivism, uh, it really is, uh, we used to call it rehabilitation. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's probably a bad word. I'm from Massachusetts, by the way. Yeah. And I remember the Willie Horton story very well. Uh, but I, I, I don't see it grabbing on, you know, with the Tea Party movement or any other, uh, you know, sort of regular person movement. Forget about conservative movement or yeah. liberal movement. I think for a number of reasons, this is going to be a state-based effort. The one is the federal government doesn't have that many people in prison um, compared to states. Uh, I mean, don't shoot somebody on an Indian reservation, and you can basically stay out of federal prison. Uh, you know, there's, some crime, there's some drug crimes and tax crimes, but this, it's not the, the same size as the, it's a fraction of a fraction of state and local prison and, and jail populations. Uh, and the cost is similarly uh, less. It's more now. They still have a bunch of people in prison who probably shouldn't be in prison. It's still too expensive, and they certainly. I think we could probably get by with a thousand federal crimes rather than four thousand. Uh, but what you did see was the beginning of this conversation with a Republican Democrat coalition on reducing the cr the, the mandatory minimums for crack cocaine. Now, if you can touch an issue like that, which could be the third rail of American politics, certainly was in the 1980s, because we, we moved exactly the opposite way on that uh, subject. So I, I think what Washington has done is shown that you can get Republicans and Democrats to move forward on an issue like that, that if conservatives take leadership of the issue, that an issue that was otherwise driven by the, the left of center wing of the Democratic Party can become mainstreamed. Okay, but it has to be presented not as a left-wing idea, but as a common sense idea. And for that, you need Republican judges, ex-cops, um, standing up, talking about why it, it makes sense, that the, the, the person making the presentation does matter, and their track record of seriousness on fighting crime matters. Sure. I mean, that, that's, that I think is, 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 is terribly important. But again, the Tea Party guys, are saying spend less, which allows state legislators to say, okay, we heard that, how do we do it? The right on crime approach, I think, offers them, here's some savings that can be made with better policy. Um, and, and again, the, the, the way you do this is, is, is right on crime, smart on crime. You don't do it with 10% across the board. You don't decide we'll have 10% fewer people in prison, so we'll let out 10% of the murderers, 10% of the rapists, and 10% of the shoplifters. You, know, um, you want to decide who should be in prison, who's the most important to be in prison, and for how long. Um, 
And are there some people who can be not in prison but still under supervision so that you're not worried about them committing more crimes? Yeah. Well, you answered the bipartisanship of, uh, of agreeing on right on crime uh, in other states. You're finding that it is, it is agreed to with both Democrats and Republicans to, to move forward on the, on the issue? Or the, this is one of those issues that I think only moves forward if it's nonpartisan. Uh, slash bipartisan, because the liberals, if they do it by themselves, will be attacked. And in, in some states, the Republicans or conservatives could do it by themselves, but they could generally get some support from Democrats as well. And because there are going to be very serious differences of opinion on what direction the country should go in spend more versus spend less, tax more versus tax less, those are the issues in Washington, D.C., for which there's no compromise. If somebody wants to go west and somebody wants to go east, what's the compromise? Right? You know. So, but there, so what are we looking for? We want to look for those issues where elected officials can work together, Republicans and Democrats, on issues such as reforming the judicial system and the, and the prison system, where you can get left-right coalitions working together. You can't, on the mega issue of size of government or how many taxes or how much total spending, but you can on some of the reform questions. And I think that helps with people who would like to see elected officials working together when possible. Nobody, it, and when you do a right-left coalition, nobody sacrifices principle. They're, they may be doing things for different reasons, but they're doing the same, they're, they're not, nobody in a left-right coalition is doing something they hate and they're against in order to make the other guy happy. Okay, you want people that are look, working together because it because it makes sense, and both liberals and conservatives can see that this makes sense. And the other part is they need to feel it's politically safe that they won't get hit on the back of the head by a thirty-second ad calling them soft on crime. Yes. Well, the, the one idea that we actually had sold to Senator Specter to take the leadership role on before the Republicans lost control of the Senate, and then he stopped being a senator, so now we have to find another guy to do it, was do, taking for the 4,000 federal crime list, do the equivalent of the base reduction and realignment commission. Remember that, that they set up, a, Congress set up a commission. The first effort was Dick Armey said, here are the 20 stupidest federal military, ba fed military bases that make no sense at all. Let's get rid of them. Okay. Well, the 20 congressmen and the 40 senators representing those 20 bad ideas got together and went to talk to other people with similarly stupid spending projects. And they all got together and linked arms and, and decided will you defend our stupid 20 bases if we defend your stupid programs? Trying not to mention one often affiliated with Florida. Um, and, uh, they, and they all got together and came to this agreement, and we were in a worse position for trying to cut spending. We ended up with all of the problem people locked arms, not just for their own dumb idea, but for ones in other states in other programs. Uh, and we big step backwards. Who to thunk it? Come back. Dick Army and Sharp, Democrat of Indiana, got together and came up with base closings. They said, we Congress will vote that the commission of people who care about national defense will come to, up with a bunch of bases to close. And then unless we vote no, they get closed. So it takes two thirds of both houses and or the president's signature to overturn that list, okay? And they did six or seven of those. And they, they worked fairly well um, and saved several billions of dollars on an annualized basis. My thought is, and, and I'm, we're trying to re-up, the problem is getting the right guy in the House and Senate to be your leader. Take the 4,000 laws. Congress would vote. We would ask a commission of former judges and prosecutors and cops to get together and decide which of those don't have to be federal laws. And maybe come up with 200 of them 
Don't try and do them all at once. And then come back and then people could allow that to happen so that nobody actually voted to, legal, to legalize carjacking. Um, and take a bite at the apple. And I think if you did one every two years, you could take 4,000 down to 2,000 without a lot of blood on the floor. And uh, you, know, you could decide how ambitious to get, but we could, we could be moving in the right direction and having that conversation. Uh, James uh, Webb, a uh, senator from Virginia, wanted to do this, called me about it a few years ago, and then just got busy doing other things, or it didn't, the leadership didn't like him, or something happened. He just wasn't allowed to play with it. Um, but I think that maybe in his last year and a half, he or some other people, we could revisit this. Uh, he had a commission on rethinking a lot of this stuff, and it just didn't seem to, for, I don't know what happened. I was all set to go, and then nothing, it didn't happen. Uh, but I think that kind of a base closing commission, because it worked with the base closings, which was very touchy. I mean, you close a base near somebody's district, and there are raw nerves about that. Now, every one of those communities is better off because the base is now used other ways, and the country's better off because we're not spending money we didn't have to. Um, so that's been, that worked. And if you're trying to sell somebody on a project, you could be able to show them one that worked before, and nobody lost an election on the subject, and it saved money, and it did everything that you hoped it would, to transfer it to rethinking some of those um, defederalizing crimes. And I think one of the easier ones is if things that the states already make illegal, do we really need a federal, do they all need to be federal crimes too? I think we could together sell everybody on the idea that you've not legalized carjacking because there's not a federal law in addition to the state laws. But that works better if you have a commission explaining it for a year while you make progress. How's your buddy Roger Ailes feel about this? On Fox TV? You know, I met with him, I don't know, six months ago, and it, uh, we weren't focused uh, on this. But I think that there, he would be, plus, he was explaining to me he only has a certain amount of control over some of those talking heads, you know, because when you're talking to him, but could we talk to this guy about that? And he's, good luck. <laughs> uh, the, uh, again, because Right on Crime has people like Ed Meese involved in it, Dave uh, Keene of the American Conservative Union, um, Chuck Colson, it, it, it has a good pedigree to at least get a hearing from a conservative talking head on Fox or a Republican congressman or senator. It doesn't guarantee that they vote yes, but, but I mean, I will listen. This does not strike me as crazy, you know, but if George Soros came in and said the same thing, they, I, I don't hear you, okay. Um, because I have read the books, and the goal is, and then you have no prisons at all, you know, it, 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 you know at the end of the book. And some of the middle of the book is okay, <laughs> but when you get to the end of the book, you go, wait a minute, um, and so he, he it doesn't work coming from the left. It can work coming from the right, with some reasonable people, left of center people, joining you midway on some of these projects. Uh, and I think that's healthy for everybody to have some left, right. I mean, you can kick each other under the table about size of government and, and how big a bathtub we have to have while working together on some things where you can actually show improvement on people's lives and save money uh, and help to have fewer victims better treated victims, and people who spend less time being criminals. Robert? Yeah. We really had, uh, Mark's point, we really had a pivotal point a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, and Vicki Lucas was there and Allison and others, uh, before the Senate Judiciary Committee or Senate uh, Criminal Justice Committee. And before we got started, there were, unfortunately, a great tragedy where some uh, Miami cops were killed in St. Petersburg just, I think, uh, the week before. And so I, I mean, I thought, oh my God, we're walking right into the buzzsaw. No way, the Willie Horton had already shown up, you know. And, 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 and Dennis, the beauty of that was, we actually had the former state senator came up and was like, you know, beating the breast about why we needed 1020 life and why we needed 85% plus plus. And I got up and said, this is a tragedy. But you know what? That tragedy occurred under 1020 life. That tragedy occurred under the 85% rule. Why? 
because we didn't manage the system well. Okay? And I think you know, the, that Will, uh, Willie Horton boogeyman kind of rose his head. And you know what? We actually got the vote from the Senate. And they actually began to adopt, the, uh, I think, 14 to 24. And uh, Senator, you were there. Remember that? And I thought it could have turned totally against us. And it didn't because they, common sense prevailed. And um, of course, I think the person was a stalking horse for a particular group of folks that would benefit by a, a, a continued expansion of the correctional industrial complex. But it can be done. And I think the politics such with good judgment, and it was also about sizing up the risk, which we don't do well. Size up the risk of the folks that you're incarcerating or about to send to prison. Make sure you do the right kind of intervention. And listen, we're talking about some hard stuff here for these yeah. people to actually get uh, detox, to get job training, to, to be productive citizens rather than just pump iron and come back out with better uh, criminal skills. So yeah. I think it can be done. Yeah, and, and again, we're, I used to work with a group when I was in college, which went out to the lifers um, effort in uh, Walpole, we got to prison. And um, they had a lifers pack with a phone. They had a political action committee. Uh, they were raising money. Uh, they were voting. Massachusetts and Utah were the two states where people in prison could vote. And there was always a worry that some of the rural areas, the number of people in prison, if they ever actually like registered in that town as opposed to wherever they came from originally, they could end up getting themselves at least a city council member or two. Um, so th 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 there were some abuses that, that, that we need to be serious about bringing in. Eventually, because of the William Horton issue, um, they tamped down on no more weekends off for people who are in prison for life without parole. Um, uh, but, but also, you can't vote from, from prison in Massachusetts uh, anymore. I don't know whether they're allowed the political action committee any longer. Um, but I thought that was really kind of a step too far at, 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 at one point. Uh, one of the things that I think Texas did was they stopped giving you more money for more people you have in prison. Uh, and I know in trying to reform adoption uh, law, in uh, the federal government would give you money for everybody you kept in foster care. And as soon as you got 10 people adopted, Mary, who worked in the office, had to be fired because you were paid per kid in foster care, not per kid that got adopted or taken care of. But so everybody who got out of foster care by being adopted cost you money. What do you think the incentives were there? Uh, they were perverse. If the state is handing out money per person in prison for a year they're in prison, if you subsidize something, you get more of it. You know, to, so there's some questions about whether you want to give people more flexibility on doing other things with, I mean, the state's going to help local governments with criminal justice issues. Do you want to attach it to how long you put people in prison, or do you want to say, here's the resources, you decide how best to spend them. Was there a, yes? There's a, a, another part of this thing, uh, getting away from the government, which is, you know, we arrest them, we try them, we lock them up, or, or rehab them, or whatever. And that is, as we've ramped up the penalties uh, against the crime, the private sector has kind of gone along with that, to the point that where, for many people, any kind of a criminal offense is now, has a life sentence. Yeah. In the private sector, you, you can't get a job. And that's part of, everyone says, the, the biggest facet of the rehab that you, that you need. How do you get the private sector to come along here without you know, one, a government solution, which I suggest you probably wouldn't like? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And I just, I just know that there are efforts by churches and, and others to try and work on help, help bring people in and get them jobs. And I, I think that may just be one of the things where you get C3s and, and churches to mentor guys on the way out and the way in. A, beyond sort of a one-on-one -on -one approach, I'm not sure. But, but you do need to sensitize people to the idea that we do want these people working, not, not working. Um, I, I, I was working in Bulgaria after the communists lost, and they were coming up with, and my suggestion to them was, don't have regulations on who can be a hostile owner or 
But if you want to be an entrepreneur or a private sector person, just send the government a note. By the way, I'm a taxi driver. Here's my address. Not wait to get a permit from the government to be a taxi driver. And their position was, well, what if somebody was a bank robber? And I said, you'd rather him be a bank robber than a taxi driver? What was the, <clears throat> but, you know, if we found you were a ta bank robber, you can't be a taxi driver. First of all, that's not what they were doing. They were putting a limit on the number of people who would be taxi drivers for the benefit of the few people who had the taxi driver licenses. Um, but yes, at some point, we would rather have you driving a taxi than robbing banks. Senator? I'm curious, is there anybody who's quantifying, one, the number of I have some family members I'd like to recommend for <laughs> incarceration. And, and secondly, the supply side issue, because it, there's been a lot of record of just prosecutorial abuse, political abuse, you know, across as far as most visible. We have a few here in Florida. That's yeah, just pure prosecutor, prosecutorial abuse. I remember when I was a county commissioner, when we tripled the size of our jail, and the county administrator said, hey, be careful, because if you make it too big, we're all going to be there. And, and the magic was we increased the size of that jail, and man, it was full immediately to the federal mandate, but, but also the prosecutorial abuse, as well as the third arm, it's a silly law that we passed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of a three-headed monster, isn't it? It, it, it is, and we, again, I think if we bring it in gradually, people go along with it. What they're concerned about is some big change that's going to let a bunch of criminals, violent criminals, out of prison. Uh, and so even if you knew you wanted to go from here to here, I think we're in really good shape to go this far and then this far. And then each time going to people and saying, you see what we just did? You see what we thought it would do? Here's how it worked. Go this far. Um, again, it's a little like the, the concealed carry permit laws, which originally were passed very restrictive. And you, know, you had to re-up it every year, and it cost a jillion dollars. You had all this training, and you couldn't have it near ice cream places, you know, and, and then over years people got, okay, and then, they, and then they got liberalized because people were comfortable with it and all the horror stories didn't happen. Uh, and when they were looking to do this in Kansas, one group wanted to do everything at once. And some of us argued, no, not everything at once, even though in other states they're now comfortable with making it much more liberal. Um, take it a step at a time so that you don't scare the horses. And, 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 and again, you want to, I, I just think a certain gradualism helps and is work, it works to make it permanent. Because you said, you know, there are going to be crimes that happen and then everyone will want to lock everybody up, you know, because somebody got killed. And you need to figure out there are going to be crimes. And you still need to reform the system while trying to minimize the number of crimes. You know, we, we don't, I always thought politicians did a little bit better about dealing with this issue than we did with, you know, people go, we want to eliminate nuclear weapons. Okay, but they never say we're going to eliminate murders, okay, because you realize there will be murders. You want to reduce, dramatically reduce the number of murders, but you don't overpromise and say it'll never happen again if you pass my law. Um, I, I'm for gradualism because I think, again, the whole idea of, of the base closing idea, we, we didn't do every base you could close the first commission. It took seven commissions to get a bunch of them done because you never wanted it to be upended against you in the process to stop. The, the, you know, limp, getting too many federal laws, too many state laws, too many silly laws, and too many people in prison didn't happen overnight. We're not going to fix it overnight. Um, but I think ratcheting it down can take, you know, 20 years from now, I go, oh, we could have done that in 10 years. Yeah, but if you didn't do it right, it wouldn't have ever happened. Thank you. Uh, any last questions? There's a gentleman here. Yeah. To follow up on Senator Albright's <coughs> question, has any state played with the idea of asking a prosecutor when he recommends a sentence to give a fiscal note with it? I am not familiar with that, but that's not, that might be helpful because it just needs to be reminded this is not for free. Now, when you go to lock up some guy, pardon? They do that? 
Oh. Missouri, Missouri is not, uh, they complete fiscal note, but they have uh, the analysis of uh, the, the factors that go into, into, into sentencing. But, but make the prosecutor say that they're spending money to incarcerate somebody and justify why that person uh, needs to be incarcerated. If that was, to the extent that is a large, that is a known number, right, there's not a lot of dispute about the cost, um, maybe jurors and judges need to be aware of that number. Now, second piece of that is we can publicize that in the local newspaper and then the people who read it eventually serve on juries. Um, I'm on the board of directors of the National Rifle Association, so I never get to be on juries. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, uh, but th I think that would be helpful. Well, thank you, uh, Matt Grover. We, we, have a, uh, we have a small token of appreciation, and that is the uh, Great Seal of the State of Florida, some That's cufflinks okay. for you, and uh, we appreciate it. We'll see you tomorrow at the Right Center, Right Coalition. Again, I uh, thank you all. Uh, Tax Watch started into this in a very, very aggressive way about four, three, four years ago. Same reason. We saw the State of Florida looking to build not just three, but ultimately uh, 22, as many as 22 state prisons. They cost $100 million a each almost $40 million a year to operate. That's $2.2 billion, excluding the financing costs, just to build them. And that would be about $840 million a year to operate them, excluding inflation, instead of early childhood education, uh, infrastructure, economic development, et cetera, et cetera. Or, so, or leaving it with the taxpayers? We're keeping it in our pocket, God forbid, and creating jobs. So thank you, partner. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much.